Okay, moving straight into the next session. The next session will be about diffusing new technologies and supporting SMEs. I think one of the people yesterday when you gave your input said we need to talk more about what governments can do to support SMEs in this re revo uh, revolution, next production revolution. So that's what we're going to try and start to talk about today. So I'd like to ask the first speaker. We have um, Phil Shapira, who's a professor at, at the University of Manchester and the Georgia Institute of Technology, and also one of the uh, authors of one of the chapters, I think, in this next production revolution report. So he's going to talk about um, technology diffusion and how, how to work with um, SMEs. Please, Phil. Thank you very much, uh, Silver and... Uh I very much appreciate the comments of the of the ministers. Very very inspiring. Um, I'm going to talk uh, about institutions for technology diffusion. As Sylvia said, this is work uh, with uh, one of my colleagues at Georgia Tech that's going to feed into the uh, the OECD report. So it's really just a headline summary of the main main points that we're, we're writing about and contributing. So I want to talk about the importance of technology diffusion, uh, some of the main findings uh, that relate to the next revolution in production, and some policy uh, insights. Um, not sure if I do or do not have to emphasize this uh, in this audience, but we, we often get very enamored by, by the new technology, the exciting digital future, the, the biological turn. We get excited about the research and the promise. But um, the promise doesn't come to anything unless we use it. So it's just a very simple point about the importance of technology diffusion. Uh, and, and it's the, the process by which we actually spread and apply these new products, these new processes, these new methods, and it could be uh, in manufacturing, but I guess also in, in, in the educational sector, as we were, as we were talking about. Um, and unless we diffuse these new technologies, these new ideas, the, the, the benefits that we hope for really <coughs> won't be realized. And, and you could all, almost go to say, if we fail to diffuse, uh, some of the problems that we face will get worse um, to the extent to which these technologies are addressing some of our larger societal challenges. So uh, the point of our contribution is just to emphasize the importance of technology diffusion. And you know why, why innovations are not necessarily adopted? Why doesn't this happen uh, in the marketplace? So there's just this generic idea that there are a variety of market failures. So there could be uh, issues related uh, to the availability of skills, to money, kind of on the supply side. Uh, there can be demand side uh, uncertainty. Companies are not sure whether they can sell products using these new technologies. Lots of issues of imperfect information. Um, I think path dependency and lock-in is very important to understand. So this is uh, where companies and institutions continue to use older methods, and they still somewhat work. They're not a disaster, they work, but they're not the most optimal methods, but they get locked in to old ways of working. And so kind of transitioning that is complex, and it's often really not so much about money, it's about attitude and knowledge and, 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 uh, and, and, and strategy. Uh, there's also something to mention, um, public failure. Uh, so uh, there are plenty of gaps in the way in which government institutions, public programs uh, approach this problem. We, we, again, we put a lot of money into R&D. We, we tend to put a lot less resource in the diffusion, again, particularly for, uh, from the perspective of SMEs. So we're focusing uh, in this work on what we call these institutions for technology diffusion. So these are the intermediaries, the structures, the mechanisms that can facilitate the adoption of, of knowledge, the adoption of technology. And I think in any complex, uh, modern, developed society, there are many of these institutions. It's not like there is one, there is no silver bullet, but there will be a variety of, of mechanisms and institutions uh, organized in a, in a number of ways that facilitate this process. And they may combine tangible presences, physical facilities, applied business-facing R&D centers, 
uh, with soft aspects, people. Uh, I think Bill Bonvillian yesterday talked about uh, knowledge transfer being going on two feet. I think that's, that's very true. Even in this digital era, the role of person-to-person, person-to-group interaction is very important. Uh, in our work, uh, we're focusing particularly on public and quasi-public institutions. So there are, there are private mechanisms. In, in this particular piece of work, we focus uh, more on the public side. So uh, just to give you some examples of what we're talking about, and this shows you the spread. Uh, these institutions can range from things that we call dedicated field services, where agents work with companies, particularly small companies, to help them adopt technology, deal with that path dependency problem, help them find financing, uh, you know, applied R&D uh, centers, information exchanges. Um, the, the ones in blue are kind of more traditional. The ones in this other color uh, going towards the bottom are kind of newer approaches, more networked uh, approaches. But this kind of gives you an, a, a sense of the, of the array uh, of, of mechanisms. And uh, across the OECD countries and other countries, there's a, there are a variety of these. Uh, but some of them are very important. I think I know we've, we've, we've mentioned Fraunhofer and its kind of business-facing role in Germany. In the US, the Manufacturing Extension Partnership and the applied, uh, the, the manu new manufacturing institutes, again, playing a very important uh, intermediary role. One of the things I've been trying to think about uh, in this kind of new or next, next revolution in production, what are its drivers and forces? And how might they be? Uh, how might they, they themselves drive the institutions? So uh, we have things like well, there'll be th these institutions have to deal with new technologies. Uh, they'll have to deal with new business models, more open, networked. Uh, they'll deal with customers, but maybe not only individual customers, but they have to work in regional ways and with with value chains and with clusters. And I guess the plus plus, I think uh, they have to deal with societal questions. And these came up a lot yesterday, sustainability, responsibility, um, making sure the benefits are reasonably well shared, dealing with issues of risk. So this is a kind of a new mission uh, that for, for technology transfer institutions to kind of incorporate. There are a variety of tested approaches. Uh, you can read them, diagnosis, uh, brokerage, contract R&D, but there are some new approaches, a kind of more, more open user engagement, uh, digital ways of working, and a variety of organizational forms. Uh, from the fixed to, to the virtual. So I think the argument is that uh, in this next production revolution, these institutions kind of have to change um, uh, with, you know, concomitant with the way in which uh, the world is changing. So here, here are some examples. Uh, I'll just give you a couple of, uh, these are very established ways of working. So, so basically you have People with expertise, but not necessarily a huge research, <laughs> just people with expertise, go out, work with companies, diagnose them, update them, refer them, get projects going, deal with training, deal with other issues. Uh, the second one, which is the example, is the Canadian IRAP program. You have people with expertise and money, a little bit of money that they can use directly to facilitate. And the applied technology centers are people with expertise, but with facilities, and they can kind of undertake applied, um, customized, often very high value, specialized research projects uh, with companies. Uh, you see these in Japan with the Kozet Sushi Centers, particularly dedicated towards SMEs, but you also see these kinds of centers in other, uh, other countries, and they're, they're emerging, I think, uh, in, in the US. Uh, but here's another way of working. So this is a kind of an emerging model. So I, I refer here to the BioBricks Foundation, um, which um, uh, uh, based in the US, but really is uh, international. And the point of BioBricks is to kind of be an open mechanism to engage people, to, to educate, uh, to transfer knowledge, and also to help develop the components, the standardized parts, uh, also the mechanism, new kinds of mechanisms for technology transfer in synthetic biology. So this is one of the next, uh, one of the technologies in the next production revolution. 
And here is a, here is a, a, a large scale, I mean, tens of thousands of people engaged in its activities. It's linked with iGEM, which again involves tens of thousands of students. And it's engaging them not only in the technological aspects, but also thinking about applications and uh, responsibility issues and intellectual property issues. So it's a very open organization. Uh, and I think an interesting example of a new model of, of technology transfer. So uh, in our study, or in our report, we kind of go through both uh, how established models kind of adopt new approaches. So uh, the, we, we, ex we would expect the existing institutions to adapt and change, and also the new institutions uh, will emerge. Um, in the interest of time, maybe I just highlight, again, around the synthetic biology research and knowledge transfer centers in the UK. I think this is an interesting combination of, uh, of research, but uh, there's also a commercialization mission. Uh, there is an embedded uh, re responsible research and innovation element. Uh, there is a roadmap that kind of gives guidance. There is a, 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 a governmental academic industry kind of coordination. Uh, it's trying uh, in some of the centers, kind of the far startup approach. So there's a lot of interesting experimentation uh, going on. So it's not just the normal research center, but it's a research center, I think, or research strategy uh, configured in ways to address uh, both the technology and also the greater societal demands and commercial demands being placed on it. Uh, so um, you can always do these kind of simple kind of approaches, old versus new. Uh, actually, I think there's still tremendous value in the established approaches but we're adding on kind of new ways of working uh, on, on top of that. So it's not about throwing things away, but it's about complementing, integrating uh, some experimentation. But traditional ways of thinking about these institutions through, through market and public failure still work, but we also have to think about network economies. And we, I think we also have to think about public value in these institutions. Uh, what is it, how is it addressing societal concerns, the global challenges? Um, what, is the what is the broader public return? And unless these new institutions dealing with these new technologies can address that, I guess we'll continue to have unhappiness <laughs> amongst many members of the population, either unhappy with the technology or unhappy with the lack of jobs being provided uh, by the technology. So we have to kind of incorporate uh, this public value. Moving from known to emerging, uh, I think moving from a project focus to uh, focusing on networks and, and value chains, moving from specific small tasks and absorption to trying to help companies go on an upgrade path, not just to absorb technologies, but to become a bit more transformational. I think to do that, you need to be medium to longer term. You have to be patient. SMEs are not going to transform immediately, but you have to work with them over a period, a period of time and co-develop. The purely public is being complemented by the public-private, and I think we'll also hear about private kinds of initiatives. And new kinds of business models, more relational, more flexible, in addition to traditional ways. So uh, here are the basic policy insights, policy recommendations 101. So uh, effective institutions for technology diffusion are really necessary and integral if we're serious about the next revolution in production, and especially for SMEs, especially for SMEs. Uh, so where effective institutions exist, reward them, encourage them. Where they're a bit weak, and I know across the OECD countries, there's quite some variation in capa capability. Where they're weak, take this issue seriously and kind of work out how to redesign and transform. Uh, but because we're moving into a new era, a new open era, I think we also have to encourage new ideas, new experimentation, and kind of learn from that. And we need the kind of complementary policies that kind of come along with this. And again, some of these were talked about uh, yesterday, but uh, here's my uh, fairly simple way of thinking about it in the systems of innovation in order to 
uh, foster effective and responsible technology diffusion. Of course, we need the framework policies and the ed education regulation, IPR. We need what we might what we might call the uh, the indirect mechanisms, the, the 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 financial support, the tax schemes, the grant subsidies. Uh, but it's not just all about money. We specifically need these institutions that are going to provide real service, face-to-face, one-to-one, one-to-group, physical, virtual, all these ways of uh, interacting, uh, and essentially bridging the variety of gaps uh, between large and small firms, academic industry, uh, regional, national, regional, international, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and then, I guess my policy recommendations 102, which are the more advanced set of policy recommendations, uh, we have to engage stakeholders in this process, um, uh, including the firms, the, the users, but also publics uh, in this, again, particularly when we're dealing with, with some of these technologies that raise uh, public issues. We have to involve public in the technology transfer. We have to advance from just doing small things with SMEs to being a bit more ambitious and working on transform transformation. We have to address the many government failures in this domain, particularly in the ways in which these programs are funded and evaluated. Um, and we also need to encourage a kind of a design, build, test approach to experiment, to particularly in areas where there are gaps, develop new models and learn from that. That's what I have to say, and um, uh, thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Phil. Um, just a quick uh, follow-up question, but before I ask, I just want to say I see that it's quite cramped in the back. There are quite a few seats here, if anybody wants to sit at these uh, tables, if you want to move up and there are people standing. Um, I'd like to ask also the other uh, panel participants to get ready, but just one follow-up question, Phil. You talk a lot about institutions. You talk, talk also about emerging new approaches to technology diffusion. S so what about the people behind that, the people who... Okay, yeah. People who are running the institutions or in the SME, what, what, what about them? Yeah, I think the people that work in these institutions or are, are, are associated with them, perhaps as consultants, um, are, are crucial. I mean, that's the thing that make, makes it work and their, their ideas, their expertise. I think um, we need people with, 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 with technical expertise and industrial expertise, but we also, you need to populate these kinds of mechanisms with, with people who can engage with other people and can, can, can mentor, can cajole a little bit, can understand and have interpersonal relationships uh, to kind of uh, really, really facilitate this process. So I think that's, and, and be entrepreneurial. So it's a big task, not necessarily everything all in one person, but in the mix of people, you need to have uh, this set. And I think um, th these institutions, um, I don't know that people, some people might work in them all their life. Mm but it's also an incredible training ground for, um, uh, for agents f to get experience with a variety of companies, and usually they get hired away by someone at some point, and that should kind of be viewed as success because mm. they get these broad skills and then they kind of can apply them in a specific way and you bring in new people, mm. but, but the strategy for the people development is crucial. It's crucial. This. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to ask the other panelists to come up, please. Shall I sit down? Um, why don't you sit okay. there, and then I'll... Um, um, so we have um, four panelists. We have uh, Mimi Aladin from Business... She's head of business development at Siemens. We have Bill Bonvillian, who we, t who we heard from yesterday. We have Johan Frisk, who's CEO of a small company called Opiflex in Sweden. And then we have um, Dr. Ulrike Tagscherer. She's a management business development, model development of Fraunhofer Gesellschaft. And I think we have a, a great mix to talk about some of the aspects that Phil just raised. So to start off with, perhaps, Mimi, um, you know, Phil talked about uncertainty at SMEs and that they're a bit reluctant to adopt new technologies. And yeah. I think that's something that you are working with from a company perspective. Yes. We are. Uh, hello, everybody. My name is Mimi Aladin. I'm head of business development at Siemens. Uh, having this role in a company like Siemens, who is involved in so many areas like energy, infrastructure, smart industry, and digitalization, it's quite challenging. But I've come to realize that my role is to know a little bit about almost everything we do and not the other way around. So it's a really uh, honor to share the stage with such experts in this area. 
Uh, thank you, first of all, for Vinova and Minister Dunberg for inviting us and arranging this conference. Uh, and I will talk about what Siemens is doing in this new production revolution. Uh, the first slide I will not pay so much time to, since we have been discussing yesterday about what this is all about. The environment for industries is changing due to digitalization. And we have also been now involved in, in uh, diffusing the technology. So let's go on and see what Siemens has been doing so far. A couple of years ago, we conducted this report uh, to explore the trends of productivity and pro uh, production in Sweden. This is in Swedish, uh, only for Swedish, uh, Swedish market. And the conclusion was that something needs to be done now in order to stop the declining trend. So, of course, now we are in engaged in several activities when it comes to diffusing uh, the new technology. And I will uh, explain or at least share some of them what we are doing. First of all, worth mentioning is, of course, this innovation partnership uh, program, which was announced, by, is announced and established by the government. Uh, earlier this year, and this is really highly appreciated and welcomed. And we are, of course, part of the group working with Connected Industry. We have also been uh, initiator of uh, an award together with some other companies, uh, initiated a, a prize for smart industry. And this is for uh, create awareness about the new production revolution, of course. Uh, the aim is not only to nominate uh, three SMEs and award one of them. It's also about create awareness, go to the SMEs and conduct seminars and, and make them start the digital transformation. We, have also, we will also, of course, continue our engagement in the strategic innovation programs, which has been running for a couple of years, like Production 2030, uh, focusing on discrete manufacturing, but also PIA, which is uh, focusing on uh, process industry. And our now latest uh, engagement is Software Center. Uh, they go, uh, it's uh, companies and universities work together to accelerate the adoption of uh, new approaches to software engineering. And the goal here is to increase the productivity by 10 times in 10 years. So this is really new, so I'm really looking forward, forward to what it, what it will be in this, in this constellation. So now, what is this new production uh, revolution all about, according to Siemens? What's our vision in this? And this picture actually summarizes it uh, very well. It's about seamless integration of data along the value chain, from the idea of a product to the real product to service. It's about combining the virtual world of a digital twin with the real world of manufacturing in the, and in the end having the <coughs> data-driven service with predictive maintenance through cloud-based uh, cloud data. And all the data from all phases can be then fed back to the engin uh, engineering phase in a closed loop. And what are the benefits of having this? Of course, we can see, we can develop and manufacture new products much faster than we do now. And also perfectly tailored uh, according to individual customer uh, requirements. The amount of resources and energy will be lower without compromising the quality. And of course, introducing this holistic view, uh, holistic um, processes into a greenfield company is much easier than for a brownfield company. But my message is that it's everybody should start the journey towards uh, implementing this since it's a, it's a modular system. So you can actually start wherever you want in this process. You can start by implementing data-driven predictive maintenance service, uh, service and then the other phases. And in the end, having all those processes integrated together and then having this industry 4.0. So my final message to SMEs is that new production revolution is here to stay. It's not complicated, it's not complex, and it's not uncertain. You have to start your digital transformation now. Thank you. Thank you, Amy. And so...
just very quickly, so, so just for those of you who don't know, I think the first slide where you were showing all these programs, a lot of these are like government initiatives yes. or industry association initiatives that, are, that you're part of. Yes. And then in the last slide, I think, what, what, so what you're saying is what Siemens is offering is, is sort of services that will address all these different steps for companies. Yes. Is that a way of, yes. and you're trying to say, and in order to lower the threshold for the SMEs, you can start anywhere. You don't have to buy the whole package. Yes. Okay. So I think this is a, a really good compliment to what, to, to what Phil's been talking about, perhaps to sort of overcome this reluctance that might exist. So ha have a seat. I mean, we'll get thank back you. to, um, thanks a lot. We'll get back to you in, in the discussion. But I think we'll take um, Johan Frisk now. He's, he's um, CEO of Opiflex, which is a robotics company. So very briefly, Johan, if you would like to just tell us what, what your company does and what you think is, uh, you know, what, what challenge you're trying to address. Yes. Uh, good, good morning, everyone, and, and thank you for uh, inviting me here. Uh, it's a, p a real honor. Uh, uh, my name is Johan Frisk, and I'm CEO of uh, OpenFlex. Uh, we are a small, uh, innovative SME in Sweden, and we have created a mobile robot for uh, competitive SME manufacturing. Uh, our passion is to solve end-user challenges with simplicity and flexibility. And I will try to guide you through a little bit how it all started and, and what we have seen for the SMEs. First of all, we understood that the SME is a massive market. It's 99, this is based on Eurostats, it's 99% of all the manufacturing enterprises. It's 59% of all manufacturing employees. And it's 44% of all manufacturing value add. but they have extremely low robot penetration. Less than 10 robots in 10,000 employees. If you compare that to the automotive sector, they have roughly around 1,100 up to 1,400 robots per 10,000 employees. In general industry, normally around 200. So this is a very low figure for these SMEs. And this, of course, results in a very poor uh, apparent labor productivity, about half compared to the large companies. So there's a big uh, poten potential for the SMEs, and it's an important area for us. Uh, so we under wondered why haven't they automated? They are struggling with manual, uh, manual operation but they want to automate, but it's very difficult. Uh, so the challenge is low, low machine utilization, small series, and also manual access is really critical for them, for these small series. And the consequences are that uh, they have a long payoff for a fixed robot, difficult and costly to program, it's, uh, and the fixed robot blocks the machine for manual operation. So out of this, we created our requirements. So you should easily be able to share a robot with several machines, easy to program the robot, and we should have no fences in order to have full manual access to the machine. So we created this. Uh, so we can easily share a standard robot. We're using ABB robots for the moment. We use a standard robot with a standard robot controller. And we can easily share that with all peripherals, IOS, safety solutions with several machines. Uh, we have a docking solution, uh, the red one you see below the platform. So we can uh, uh, dock in front of the machine with high precision and high stability. So we can large, run, run large robots with full speed and high precision. We are very proud. We won the Business Innovation Observatory Award last year by the EU Commission for this. Since then, we have created the Dynamics Fenceless Safety Solution, so we can fulfill e all EU regulations without fences, also for large robots. And we have created the easy robot programming, uh, taking programming to the next level, so anyone can program a robot in 10 minutes instead of three to four hours by a specialist. Uh, and of course, it's connected. Uh, for this, uh, we're also pleased to be a finalist, one of, the, one of three in the world for the most prestigious uh, robotics and automation award this year. Um, 
And if we look then on the fourth industrial revolution, robot sales are increasing rapidly. And China is buying most robots in the world. They are buying more than Europe altogether. Now we have a chance to bring back manufacturing to, to Europe. If you would ask any of these large companies, they would, of course, prefer to buy locally because it's much more convenient if we are competitive. The nice thing now is automation costs the same in Europe as in China. So here we have a lot of opportunities now to bring back manufacturing and be competitive. Uh, and to all of you policymakers here, I would like to, to send two things. We have listened to a lot of uh, companies uh, before this meeting and asked them what would I address. One is, as we heard from Phil as well, smart manufacturing test beds out there, real, prove the technology so they can learn and see that it's really working because they are quite conservative and skeptic and not aware of this technology. But we also would like to see uh, uh, SME innovation growth loan for companies like us working with uh, advanced technology and especially hardware to support us over the commercialization phase that cost roughly 10 times as much as development. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot, Yuan. <laughs> Thanks a lot. So please have a seat. Yeah, and so. Basically, what you're saying is that you see a huge, huge potential for robotiz robotization among SMEs, and um, you don't think it's happening um, um, as quickly as it, as, as it could. No, uh, unfortunately, there are a lot of people have tried before in the 80s, 90s, and, and it was not possible. And now they are not aware of these new technologies, and they are so focused just to survive. Mm -hmm. And we see a lot of companies uh, go bankruptcy in this globalization. Mm. But now we have the, the opportunity and we have to educate them mm. and, and have some good sh examples proving the pathway forward. Mm. And it's interesting because you're also a small S an SME at the same time and you've had a lot of development work. For example, this thing that you said, me being able to make the robot, robot without the fences because yep. you have to meet a ton of requirements to be able to do that, right? Yes, so yes. It's, it's a journey that you've been on too. Yeah. Yep. Very interesting. Thanks a lot. Um, turning to the, the, the last two members of the panel, Uli Tagscherer, um, you work for the Fraunhofer, the, the central organization. You've been working for, with them for a long time, among others, uh, eight years in China. Um, Fraunhofer has been mentioned a lot the last couple of days. So, and I know you've done a bunch of surveys uh, among SMEs, listening to Phil, listening to these two companies. So what, what can you tell us about the story of technology diffusion in SMEs? Yeah. So thank you, first of all, for, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I think um, all of them have touched issues which we um, identify too. So we did a couple of surveys over the last year among our own SME customers and among our institutes under, trying to understand their role for small and medium-sized enterprises in Germany and in Europe. So it was not restricted on Germany. With the final goal to support policy making in Germany, to help our government um, in trying to figure out how can we help SMEs to transform in all the different technology areas, so not limited to robotics or um, digitalization. And... Um, what struck us most maybe was that um, the, the word trust was mentioned almost in every interview we did. And I think that goes along with what Phil tried to say um, earlier. You have to have that one-to-one -one contact. So we can't uh, only build platforms. They are important today too. The virtual world exists. But for the small and medium-sized enterprises, if you have only 20 employees, um, you want to know. You depend on these decisions and uh, you, you want to meet that person before you um, give them a research contract or a development contract or whatever. And building that trust, and that's something trust you have to earn. That's an important um, issue for us. So we have 
um, we think we are quite good at it, but we still can do better. Also in taking, um, giving the, the SMEs a hand in walking that path um, on the way to transformation. And the good thing is, if they trust us, if they have worked with us and they trust us, it's much easier for us to diffuse uh, new technologies because they say, oh, I've worked with you three times already. If you tell me that this new technology has the potential to really um, bring me a, a benefit in six or 12 months, I trust you. And then they do it. And then they even go faster than the big companies. So we also asked, what is the difference between the small and the big companies? And they said, um, for us, the small companies are the innovation drivers because they, they can't fail. If they, if they trust us, if they give us a project, we have to deliver, and they only will give it to us if we can prove that they can make use of it. So it's not the report. It's not uh, the documentation of a new material that they are interested. They are only work collaborating with us if they really can make use, if their production uh, benefits, if their products uh, can achieve a higher value or whatever. But they need to see it in money and on a very short term. So, of course, they won't develop, they won't spend three millions and develop a new material, lightweight material with us over three or five years. That's not possible. But to, for, the, for the part of the diffusion, and you also mentioned earlier, and you mentioned it too, that's a really, really important um, collaboration. And so if we go back to the question, what can poli uh, policies do or politics do, um, understanding the roles of research institutes. And here, we also see a difference to universities. Um, what, what we learned in our interviews was that in, in the small and medium-sized enterprises, especially in Germany, many, many of them are family-owned, meaning that people will stay there for 20 or 30 years in the leadership roles. And they value it very high that we at Fraunhofer, besides a high turnover rate, we always have also a continuous uh, workforce. And that's the biggest difference um, toward, uh, with the universities, where the, the staff turnover is so huge and then they have a PhD student and then the student leaves and then they have to build the trust again and so working with universities seems in, in from our understanding um, a little bit more difficult for the SMEs they can get a, a good project uh, they, they do collaborate with the universities too but when they come to us when they come to, to Fraunhofer um, they appreciate that also with us sometimes people can stay for 10 or 15 years and they don't um, they don't change. Mm -hmm. And then, again, you can see that that builds trust. And we have SMEs um, where we have following contracts for maybe 10 successive years. You can't offer them a, a huge project in the beginning, but you can do the small steps. Um, and it doesn't mean that it's only incremental innovation. Mm. That's doesn't mean that. Mm. Very interesting. I think before we turn to Bill, I also want to ask you also, since you have a lot of knowledge about China, and I think we haven't talked very much in this conference about China, which is the largest manufacturing economy in the world. Um, Yuan mentioned it, they buy as many robots. Um, what's your view? I mean, where, first of all, do, you know, do we have to worry about China and where are they in this next production revolution? I don't worry about China. I sometimes worry about Germany because I think we are too slow. <laughs> um, but the point with China is that um, there, is, there exists so many different Chinas. So you can find really innovative companies, really innovative areas. And then the next day, 500 kilometers away, you go to an area where we can never talk about Industry 4.0. We talk about Industry 1.0 or 1.5, something like that. So you have all these different realities and different requirements. And um, at the same time, I think that China has one big advantage, and that's that a lot of um, structures haven't been built and uh, a lot of they, they are not so locked in as the, the established companies in, in Europe. And if, if I'm a company in Guangzhou and 30% uh, of my workforce 
doesn't come back after Chinese New Year because they can find new employment closer to home, closer to their parents and their children, which they usually leave behind, um, then of course automate, automatization is, is the answer to that uh, question. Mm. So, um, and these decisions are then easier made than in a German uh, company which has uh, done all the same things for so many years and has been successful and maybe still is successful. Um, they, it's hard for them to anticipate the future. And I think so what you're talking about, there's a, there's a different agility, uh, perhaps, definitely. than a lot of the Chinese, out of necessity also. Out of necessity, definitely. But also, they can't survive. Exactly. Yeah. But also what you and I, because we, we do a lot of work on innovation policy in China, but what we talked about is that there's also a different agility in the policy making. Oh, definitely. Yeah, they get a lot of support. I mean, mm. I guess all of you know the China Manufacturing 2025, Internet Plus plans. And uh, if your government strives towards that direction, it it has an impact on the companies. I mean, mm. in China, again, policy and making and uh, industry is much closer linked. So companies usually follow more what governments say. That's not the case in Germany mm. in, to the same extent. And sometimes maybe companies even would make uh, decisions just because a policy is there and not because it's their um, entrepreneurial mm, uh, need, right. but still it gives a thrive for the country. It gives them a direction and it's easier to change your mind if everybody else um, goes into that direction. You just feel that you have to do something. Mm, mm. You, you can't just mm. sit and hold back. Yeah, so, and I, so both things influence each other. Yeah, I think that's a fascinating story. Turning to, to Bill, first of all, what have, you've heard here a lot, you talked about the insti your institutes yesterday, what Uli is saying about this interaction, you know, the trust-based interaction, but also any other, co any other comments you'd like to pick up, Bill? Sure, thanks, Sylvia. And, and, and Phil, I just wanted to thank you for, you know, your diffusion framework, which I really think helps make this whole panoply of policy efforts uh, add up. Uh, I wanted to put another you know, diffusion model on the table. Yesterday I talked about the manufacturing institutes. Um, and this one is related to the scale-up problem that, uh, that I talked a bit about yesterday. Um, and in particular, the U.S. economy has become very dependent on startups to really bring new innovations up to scale. Uh, but we've run into this problem which is that the, the scale-up process is funded in the U.S. to the tune of about $60 billion a year by our very robust venture capital system. But that venture capital system is now focused over 60% on two pieces in the innovation panoply. Software, which is about, in 2015, was 40, almost 40% of all venture capital investment and biotech for very different reasons, a uh, little over 20%. And then in between are a series of services sectors like media, entertainment, financial services. Uh, and then there's this little slice, if you looked at a pie chart, that's 5%. And that's industry, industrial and energy. 5%. Right. So that's where the hard technologies are, right? That's where the stuff is that we're going to have to manufacture. That's the future of U.S. manufacturing. And the startup model is broken, right? And we talked yesterday about social disruption. The U.S. venture capital system and startup system is not focused on job creating areas. To some extent, you get what you invest in, and we're going to multiply our problems. It's not that there's anything wrong with software. It's nothing wrong with biotech. Those are obviously very important investment fields. But that's not the only stuff that we need to do. So we began running into this problem when we looked at scale up for startups in the context of these manufacturing reports. And we thought, oh, we have to find a new kind of financing. And we spent a lot of time wringing our hands trying to figure out what the replacement financing model might be for venture capital that could bring, bring billions into hard technology scale up. We looked at existing programs. We thought about the scale that was needed. This was not going to happen, right? So I had a conversation with MIT's president, uh, who comes really out of the semiconductor area. 
And I said, Raphael, we, we've got this huge scale-up problem for hard technologies, companies that want to manufacture, and we can't figure out the financing alternatives. And he leaned back. He's younger than I am, but you know, in this fatherly MIT presidential kind of way, he kind of leans back and so Bill, and he's from Venezuela, so he has a Latin American accent. He said, Bill, you have it all wrong. Substitute space for capital. And I said, what are you talking about? And he said, look, create a space that does, that essentially creates what the venture funds would be funding, that does the advanced prototype, the demonstration, the testing, and public pilot production, right? Create a very technology, equipment, know-how rich space where those things could happen. Bring a bunch of startups in there that are doing hard technologies and let them thrive, you know, let them take advantage of this. Um, so it's an intriguing idea for a model, and it turns out there are actually some examples going on in the U.S. already along these lines. So the Department of Energy has run into a problem with venture funding for new energy startups. Because energy is a legacy sector, they have to have new technologies to startups. And they're having a lot of trouble getting these startups going. They're hitting a wall for scale-up financing. So they created one of these, what MIT's president calls an innovation orchard outside of Lawrence Berkeley Laboratory. And it's, you know, it's an interesting model. They attracted now, I think, close to 24 startups are sitting there. It's like this kind of nerd motorcycle gang parked outside this old historic federal lab facility, you know, out, up above Berkeley. And they've given the motorcycle gang keys and told them to loot the place, right? That's the technology transfer model. It's a very interesting tech transfer model. You know, we've been waiting for our federal labs to transfer technologies out. This is a, this is a go in and take the technologies looting model, and it may be a lot better model, right? So we have one of those. The Department of Energy is working on a couple more. Uh, there's a very interesting project in Boston called TechBridge. Uh, that's supported actually by a front office center in Boston uh, that has a different view, ask companies what they want, and then tie the startups to them. Okay. Bill, uh, so there's some models, and MIT is now trying one of these, uh, which is called the engine, and it's about two weeks old, so we'll see what happens. Thanks a lot, Thank Bill. you. Thank you. I, I just want to open up. We have a, I'm going to go maybe five minutes over time in the call because we start a bit, little bit late, but are there questions? I'd like to, I have some, some more questions to the panel, but... Questions from the audience, please. I think we've give, been given a lot of interesting information. I think a lot of things that Bill picked up is addresses the, the needs that you were talking about, Yuan. The need, you know, why is, there, why is it more difficult to get funding, as Mimi also said, and why do we need the space for demonstration, prototyping, right? Um, any questions from the audience? Oh, right there, please. Thanks very much. A question for Phil, if I may. Could you say a little bit more about the mismatch which you alluded to between the incentives that some of the public technology transfer agencies receive and their mandate or their mission? The tension that exists. What, what may governments be getting wrong in the way that they incentivate these institutions? Are there any more questions? Right here, please. We'll collect maybe three. There's one more here after that. Okay. No, it's, it's a question to uh, Bill. Uh, you talked about this uh, space and capital story. And um, uh, are there any policy consequences that you, uh, you know, see, see from this? It sounds to me, if I understood you right, that this is a, like if manufacturing is a fixed cost problem, whereas the others, many of the others are like variable cost things. And that these... Um, looting the, the places is sort of taking off some of the fixed costs. Is, is that the, the, the problem? Or, or if you could elaborate on that, because that's a dramatic shift, of course, in, in the, how, we, how we think about it, if it's a fixed cost or variable cost problem. Okay, we have one more question here, and then a comment over there, and then we'll let the panel answer. Thank you. Um, Christian Reimsbach. Um, I'm, I'm interested in the concept of past dependencies that you introduced in the beginning. Um, 
And I was wondering, what is the role of short-term thinking that seems to be also prevalent um, in, 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 in the market? So the fear of, of the idea of, um, let's say, the fear of losing profit in the short term for benefits, for long-term benefits. And then when I look at China, as, China as, as has been said, it seems to be less that, that problem because there is a higher trust in governments and governments basically providing that strategic orientation for many businesses so that they don't have to fear about short-term profit losses. Okay, interesting. And then one more comment here. I just wanted to elaborate a little bit on something that uh, Bill, uh, Phil talks about, which is IGEM. Um, I've been very involved with IGEM for 10 years. Um, 25,000 students have gone through that. Do not be mistaken in thinking this is a low-level students competition. It is an extremely high-level student competition, which this year involved 270 of the world's best universities. Uh, the key point about iGEM is that uh, this has created a pool of young people who uh, have gone into industry, actually. So I reckon around 60 to 70% of the people who have gone through iGEM, one way or another, are now in industry. Many of them actually in their own startups. Uh, which are actually being supported. So iGEM is a fantastic model. I mean, although I've been involved in it, I'm not one of the people who organizes mm. it, mm. so I can say this. Mm. Uh, it's a fantastic model for how you get a, a new industry off the ground in terms of personnel. And it's a competition, right? And it's a, it's a, it's mm. a very intensive competition, mm. which runs over every summer. Mm. And then the first week, weekend in November, there is... Uh, what's called the iGEM Jamboree, where everybody comes together, 2,500 2, students and their advisors in Boston. Nowadays, it's held at the Boston Convention Center. It used to be held at MIT, but it's got too large. Thank you. So we have a few questions. Uh, I don't know, Phil, do you want to start? And also, if, you want to, if there's anything you want to comment on from what the other panelists have said. Yeah. I didn't quite get the first question from Alistair. Could you, maybe because I couldn't quite hear it, but. Um. Okay. Uh, it, yeah, no, please, it's better if you restate <laughs> Yeah, Phil, in your presentation, you mentioned that the, there's, there's governance challenges around the operation of some of these public or you know, quasi-public technology transfer institutions. So the governments may be giving incentives, say, the criteria against which governments evaluate the effectiveness of these institutions. Yeah. And I understood you to be saying that there's some mismatch or tension between those incentives, those criteria, and the emerging missions or mandates, what these institutions should be aiming to achieve. Uh, I, if I can answer, I think there are many mismatches uh, from a government perspective. One is perhaps about uh, the scale of attention given to technology diffusion uh, in general. But the specific one that, that you mentioned is very important because uh, there's, a, there's a tendency in evaluation to evaluate a specific program a specific project with a company and look at the immediate short-term return. Um, uh, and like on a, almost on a quarterly basis. Um, but if we're serious about addressing path dependency and working with clusters, then the programs have to spend time, maybe over a, a period of years, educating and cultivating, and there's not an immediate return to that. And I think uh, short-term purely financially based um, evaluation systems can give the wrong incentive. Um, and it's driving it more to a consulting model rather than a public mm. purpose model. Mm. Uh, while I'm talking, I mean, I think on um, yeah, path dependency is so interesting. Usually, the r why do we keep doing things which are not, that, not the best? It's because they still work, right? So many companies, particularly small companies, are using 1950s, 1960s, 1970s, they still work. The thing is, we have something better for them, and how do you make that kind of transition? And it could be they could be locked in by the customer, they could be locked, but they're often locked in by their own understanding uh, of the world. So I think kind of tr explaining a strategy, building trust, as, as Uli said, and um, going through the numbers, showing them an example somewhere else, these are kind of some of the ways to, to break down that. I'm not sure that China is too much different. I mean, that China is newer in, in a sense, but uh, many companies in China have got used to a very routine, cheap way 
of making things and very labor exploitative. Uh, some companies are beginning to make a transition to a kind of a higher value, but there's still a lot stuck in that older model, and it still works for them, right? Um, if if, um, if Johan is effective, it will work less and less for them <laughs> in the future, but it still works for them now. So this is this in interesting mix. And maybe just one more thing while I'm talking, then I'll shut up. Uh, on universities, uh, I think um, uh, the, the Fraunhofer is, is, is really great, and I have been associated, as you know, with one for, for a number of years. But universities, you know, must have a role in this, but, but as platforms. So the worst thing is to put a university academic involved in this. But the university as an institution can do all the things that Bill was talking about, which Georgia Tech does and many other universities, which is they, they involve other kinds of people whose job is primarily to work with companies and to transfer technology and knowledge. And they interface with the academics and with mm. the students. And so there's that constant um, delivery mechanism mm. to, from, but I think, you know, universities and other educational institutions, you know, must take on that intermediary role. Mm. It's what, you know, a modern university is all about. Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. Um, who else wants to comment on some other questions? Bill, did I you, yeah? I wanted to respond to your question. The and maybe just building on what, uh, what Phil just talked about, the, uh, the idea of these innovation orchards, you know, is you're right. In other words, we have existing assets and there's an opportunity to, to a certain extent, redeploy the assets into a higher value uh, set of opportunities that serve their missions, but also create a whole set of new opportunities to get technology, knowledge, and know-how out. Of, uh, of these kind of embedded castles. So that's at the heart of this Innovation Orchards idea. And picking up on what Phil just said, universities also have lots of technology, lots of equipment, lots of know-how, right? And universities like MIT and Georgia Tech are starting to think that, gee, our commitment to our students doesn't necessarily end mm. the moment they get their diploma maybe we have to think of a continuing relationship with them. And maybe we have a role in our regional economies where we need to really think about what we're, we seem to be doing um, more of, which is in the startup frame, and how could we really take a kind of the next step, right? Lots of universities have incubators at this point to do kind of early stage support for startups developing the business plan. Universities haven't taken on the much more complicated scale-up role. But maybe there's an opportunity to redeploy those assets too, like redeploying the assets of, of, of federal labs. So mm -hmm. that's at the heart of the economic idea here. Mm -hmm. Anybody want, before we do a final round, does anybody want to comment on any more of these questions? Because otherwise, I think we need, we need to wrap up. But I would like to just ask you all um, for, for like a final round of what do you think, um, you know, having listened to this discussion, which I think was extremely valuable, what, what do you think governments should be doing? Um, and what should they focus on in trying to um, achieve this technology diffusion that you're talking about and in trying to um, help SMEs absorb these new technologies? And I think what we've heard in the discussions, Phil, uh, Bill focused a lot on, on the startups. I think Uli uh, and, and Yuan and also Mimi is talking a lot about actually existing industry, right? So, so if you could just reflect really quickly, is there anything more important that you would like to say and particularly with a focus on what could, what do you think governments should be focusing on? Yeah, go ahead, Yuan. Yeah, I, I believe the, the, the SME, manufacturing SMEs, they have uh, often old companies, uh, as I said, conservative. They are in the first or second industrial revolution. They are not close to the third, which is automation. And they, these digitalization, robotization is just passwords for them. They need a, a guidance, a guideline, how, where should you start? And as I said, to, to yeah. have tested out in their industries, not in facilities or institutions, out in the industries, help them at home in the industries, and ask them to network across sectors, across industries, to learn from each other. Bill maybe put in a robot, and I, I've been, been skeptical, and, and I see that he's happy, so, okay, maybe I dare to put the robot as well. I, I believe that. Try to mm. build the momentum mm. is really, really important and, and maybe support them with, with uh, 
uh, investment initiatives or, or whatever. Mm. Demonstration, reference yeah. projects, yes. these kind of things. I I yeah, maybe go ahead. agree to that. Mm -hmm. uh, test beds, demonstration projects. Uh, but what we lack here in Sweden is uh, this, what we discussed yesterday too, more industry scale demonstration labs like MTC Coventry. Mm -hmm. uh, Siemens in UK is uh, involved there, of course. And something like that mm -hmm. is missing in Sweden, of course. So that would be highly appreciated to have such platform. That's okay. very concrete. Uli. My recommendation for, for, for government would um, maybe first be the skills issue. So the continuous training for those on the job to, to make them uh, competitive on the labor market and not having the, face, uh, the fact that you have to lay off a thousand and employ a thousand completely different people, but uh, do that because I think that's a job um, where government support really matters. Mm. Um, that's mm. something, um, if we look into uh, our small and medium-sized enterprises, they don't even want to send their staff one day to our Fraunhofer Academy. Mm. He or she is missing a day. Right? So uh, how do we tackle that? How mm. do we support this? And that, that's something I think where, where governments should, uh, could uh, do. And the second thing is in, in Germany, and uh, we talk about the European uh, framework program, we do have funding uh, programs to support SMEs and universities and research institutes to collaborate. But looking at it from the SME perspective, they are too complicated. I've done so many interviews where the companies say, yeah, we don't even try anymore. It costs us so much resources to just file one application. And um, our scientists tell us that without us as the coordinator of these uh, projects, a lot of SMEs wouldn't even touch the public programs. It's too costly for them. And um, also the, the mechanisms in the ministries or in the funding agencies, it takes them three months to evaluate or six months to evaluate. If I'm a small and medium-sized enterprise, I've, uh, re, uh, I've blocked a certain amount of money. That's gone by that time. I mean, I, I can't hold that back until finally a ministry decides. So these processes, um, if, they, if governments could look at them and, and try to see it from the point of view of the need of the SME and what is their daily reality and then try to, to make that mm. up, mm. then I think that, that would help. We, we don't need everything new. We can also use what we already have, mm. but we need to adjust. Mm. Bill, do you want to, is there anything? You know, that, Johan raised the whole issue and you've raised the issue of, you know, the connection with the SME and so we've talked about all this advanced manufacturing and industry 4.0 opportunities and how do we bring you know, Phil's diffusion point back to the SMEs. And, you know, one piece that we're actually thinking about at MIT is to, and, and others in the Boston area, is to actually create connections between the startup community and the SMEs. And these are two entirely different worlds, right? They don't talk to each other, they don't know each, each other exists. Mm. But for SMEs facing, you know, declining business levels, connecting with innovators, you know, like this guy, for example, could offer a very interesting mm. new set mm. of business opportunities. Mm. And we're trying to work on how do you build those relationships. Your point about trust is absolutely critical because none of that will happen unless you figure out ways to really build face-to-face -face trust. So that's the key barrier, but there are ways to get around that. And it potentially creates opportunities for SMEs to mm adopt new technologies, but also for the startups to learn actually how to make something, which they don't know. Mm. Mimi had one f quick yeah, and then Phil can... I mean, of course, what government more can do is about making sure that the education system is creating the skills which we need, the resources. But here, I would also like to point to ourselves. The big companies should also maybe make sure that the, the universities and, and education system understands what we need. So it's a, it's a cross uh, responsibility, I would say. Mm. So mm. it's not only governments, but it's also us yes. making sure that they know what we need. That you are articulating. That, exactly. Yeah. Well, I, I would just like to, st to stress the importance of, uh, if, we, if you like, 21st century technology diffusion as really a central mission when we talk about the next uh, revolution in production. And if we don't, if it's weak, then we won't be able to leverage the R&D investment. We won't yep. really be able to, to meet mm -hmm. the societal challenges. But that 
mission um, needs to be customized, I think, in every country and in regions. There are different systems, different capabilities. So you look, kind of look at, look at practice, look at ideas globally. Uh, but, you know, make sure you've kind of customized it to, mm. to work mm. in your situation. Yeah. Thank you very much. I'm sorry we went a little bit over time, but I think it's been a great discussion. I just want to say the role of universities, I think, is something we should discuss a little bit more. There is, it will be a parallel session on it, and I also think I'm going to ask the state secretaries and the ministers to comment on that in the session after this one, and I think you will also be able to provide input on your phones. So we'll take that to the next uh, session. I want to thank the panel, um, thank the audience for the questions, and now we have a coffee break. Thanks. Ha, tax to him.